we mentioned the fact that uh, once I have uh, some function phi of t, uh, the question is how should I choose uh, a family of functions, hopefully orthonormal or orthogonal, so that I will be able to represent uh, my psi with this uh, class of functions. And we mentioned, mentioned the uh, standard basis, um, I mean, uh, that spans a specific set of functions, the standard, uh, uh, those that are getting one at a specific interval and zero elsewhere. And then we mentioned that multi-resolution is probably a better way to go if uh, we care about the way about uh, uh, having to represent my function, not with all the possible n functions that I have, but rather with some k which is smaller than n. Um, and then uh, somebody asked me an, uh, a very interesting question, and this is the following. Um, we mentioned that the first number to represent uh, a set of numbers would be a constant. Okay, this is fine. But why should I prefer uh, this guy, I mean, this second function over, for example, let me try to use a different color over that guy. I mean, why is the first one better than the second one? And the answer that I gave, I mean, I watched the lecture afterwards was uh, something like because there was no justific justification of preferring the red one over the pink one. Um, and this is actually a very interesting and deep question that would, uh, that would um, allow us, that would uh, be the light, the, 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 the candle uh, to, to the black path that we are walking through, because uh, this, is, this is actually the essence behind representation of signals. So now let me uh, focus into something which is a very simple problem. And this is the problem of let's limit our discussion to all functions uh, who look like that, who look like uh, what you see over here, okay? So these are all functions that are piecewise constant and they change their values at very specific points. And these points are marked as, um, I mean, th this is the kind of functions uh, that, that I'm interested in, okay? So this is the PC, piecewise constant functions and there are N intervals, okay? So there are N uh, intervals and every, uh, um, every uh, one divided by n, uh, there is a change of value in this piecewise constant functions. The question then, so this is what I know about my function, that it changes the value every uh, interval and this interval is equal to one over n or one over capital N. And the question is how many numbers do I need in order to represent such a, such a function? Anyone has any idea? N. N. So who was that? Liran. Liran. So Liran is suggesting n. Why? Because you had you need the n coefficients to each uh, area. Yeah. So uh, what Liran is saying that for each and every interval like that, a single number is enough. Okay. So for each and uh, for each and every interval, one number is enough. And if I sample, if I pick the right, if I uh, choose the right values, let's do it in blue. If I choose the right values, I know exactly how to represent back my, uh, my, uh, my signal. What would be the basis that you would use in this case, Iran? Uh, the standard basis would yeah. be enough. Yeah, so the standard basis, the one that we denoted as one as, 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 as such, uh, would probably be uh, my basis of choice. I mean, there would be one over square root of n here or a capital n, it depends how we define it. This would be my basis of choice and it would give me a perfect, uh, a perfect way of representing the, the function. Now, if somebody is giving me a number k, which is larger of n, uh, it wouldn't help me much. But if somebody is giving me a k, which is smaller than n, then uh, uh, there is almost a guarantee, I mean, not almost, there is guarantee that I will not be able to reconstruct my signal uh, perfectly. And I'm talking about the, more gen the most general case because for example, a constant value is also, uh, I mean, if I have here some constant, then this function uh, also belongs to the uh, set of uh, piecewise constant uh, functions, okay? So in this case, with a single number, I can represent it. But if I look at the most general case of functions that look like that, k number, this, my k should be equal to n. 
if I add more numbers, it would not help me. If I take less than, uh, less than n numbers, then I'm doomed to fail to represent my functions. Now, if you got this, if you understand that, then you understand everything about what we refer to as Shannon or Nyquist or whatever, but we'll do it slowly, okay? So, um, and, and the Fourier would obviously be quite trivial if you understand the whole concept of um, uh, dealing with representation spaces. So let me try and see if I can, yep, if I can, uh, yeah, I can. So what we are after now is choosing a very specific set of betas, beta of t, beta of beta i's of t, and this beta i's of t would be nothing but uh, the harmonics. But before we get into the harmonics, let me just uh, remind you, or actually teach you, those of you from computer science who didn't see um, complex numbers before. Uh, what is a complex number? So those of you who remember that from high school, uh, you're in good shape. Those of you who didn't, uh, it appears that in order to uh, deal with a specific set of phenomena in physics and in mathematics, uh, you need to define some, somehow the square root of minus one. And because this is not a real number, uh, we call it imaginary, okay? And we denote it with the letter i, small i. And this is by definition, the square root of minus one. Now, the moment you define uh, imaginary numbers, then you can add an axis if this is the real numbers. So this is the reals. So you can add another axis for the imaginary numbers. And then you, for example, you can explore the unit circle. So the unit circle is the square root of something. I mean, you can, yeah, what, what happens here is that you can travel on this unit circle and this unit circle would have an imaginary part and the real part, okay? So this would be the real part, and this would be the imaginary part. Usually we denote them as uh, some uh, real value and another real value that multiplies the square root of minus one, okay? Now, if this is alpha, then uh, the real part, and assume that I'm talking about a unit, um, about a unit radius, then this part, would be nothing but the cosine of this angle, while this part, the imaginary part, would be no, nothing but the sine of this uh, function, okay? Because remember that uh, this one is equal to one, okay? And this is how I can actually write, uh, this is a formal uh, write-up of the exponent uh, to the power of an imaginary number as having a real part and an imaginary part, okay? Now, um, k belongs to the integers. This is z defines the integers, okay? So if I'm writing, writing capital uh, z like that, it would be uh, minus infinity uh, plus seven, and uh, minus seven uh, until zero, as well as the rest of them. So k would be all the, all the integer numbers. Okay, so, what I have here is uh, a way of representing of uh, somehow, so it would be K here, and this would be an infinite family of functions by which I can try to represent a given function. Now, this is a complex function. And remember that our functions are actually uh, real functions. How would we actually use uh, complex numbers in order to represent real functions? In a moment, we'll see that. Uh, but everything else is re relatively trivial, it's relatively simple. I have two trigonometric functions, the cosine and the sine. Uh, the sine um, uh, is used to represent the, um, the imaginaries and the cosine, the, the real values. And um, for the time being, we assume that my function is defined, my psi function that I would like to represent is given to me um, on the interval between zero and one. Okay, this is the time. Um, now, the moment I write k here, okay, and this is between zero and uh, assume that t is equal to one. So uh, we see that we have, that k determines the number of oscillations that happen between zero and one. So this would amount to the sign where k equals one. This would be, this would amount to k equal to? We can't see the lower part. Like okay, below so the axis, it's like white. From or here? The only one. From here? 
Okay, okay. Let me know when you can see. Like we can see only the x axis, and below that we can't see. Okay, so this is this is my lower limit, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, what can you say? This is uh, this is where you can you actually has have uh, more engineering stuff to do. Okay, so let me work out the cosine. Okay, so the cosine uh, would look like that. Okay, between zero and one, it would look like that. So this would be uh, this would be k equal one. There is only one uh, period, one cycle that is going on here. For k equal two, uh, what would happen is that I would have two such periods. Now the nice thing about these uh, uh, these um, functions is that if I integrate over them, then you can see that the negative part is equal to the positive part. So I can subtract this one from that one, it would be equal to zero. That one from that one, it would be equal to zero. Then this one from that part, it would be equal to zero. And that one from that one uh, would be equal to zero. Which means that if I have uh, an integer number of periods between zero and one, um, uh, the integration over this harmonic would always be equal to zero. Okay, and this would be an important uh, fact when I will try to prove the orthonormality, the orthogonality of these functions. So uh, just remind me if I go below, below my lower bound and uh, we'll try to do it. Um, by the way, if I write anything here, can you see that? Let me just uh, see where my lower and upper bounds are. I would assume that this one and this one are fine, yeah? No. No, so let me go up a little bit. I think now the limit is like the left part of the screen. This is good? Yeah, now we can see. Okay, oh, okay. Okay, so uh, let's see uh, where we are going with that. Okay, so in fact, what we have is that if we integrate, if we integrate over uh, two of my members of my family, then what we get uh, is actually, I mean, this is multiplication of two exponents. I can uh, pull, push uh, the k uh, minus, I mean, k minus l here. And uh, in fact, we, we, will, we, we immediately show that it would be equal to one only if k is equal to l and it would uh, be equal to zero otherwise. Let's prove it once and for all. Uh, let's write the uh, complex exponent as its real part and its imaginary part, okay? And remember, the intuition was that um, integrating over the uh, real and the imaginary part, and you can't see over here what is going on here, would cancel out uh, unless k is equal exactly to l. So. If I um, uh, integrate in parts what is written over here, then I can push the uh, integration uh, into, the, uh, into the imaginary part. I can take the imaginary part out. And what I have here is integration over cosine and integrate, integrate, integration over sine. And remember, here I have an integer number, either positive or negative, but an integer number. And um, uh, by law of integration, I can actually write it explicitly. So it would be integration between zero and one of sine here and cosine there. And um, uh, the integration between zero and one of my cosine of my sine would be zero minus zero because I have a, a, some, re, some integer number that multiplies two pi and two pi is to whatever uh, multiplication would always give me zero. So for the sine, I get zeros, and for the cosines, I get zeros. So no matter uh, what k and l I put here, as long as k is not equal to l, uh, the outcome would always be zero. However, when k is equal to l, what I have is uh, exponent on the power of zero, which is equal to one, and integration over one, over a one period, would always be equal to one. So this is a proof of the orthogonality, inferior autonomality of the uh, strange complex basis that we have just uh, that we have just defined.
let's now uh, see how we can go. Okay. Um, so the family of complex functions that is defined as such, uh, where k belongs to the integers, uh, is orthonormal. Okay. So now the question is, uh, what happens when I'm trying to represent a function, a real function? So this guy belongs to the real functions. Okay. Each and every number here uh, belongs to R. In fact, uh, um, uh, we can write it like that or like that, okay, instead of uh, the lower limit and the upper limit that belong to R. And, and what I have is that the approximation of uh, Psi T would be Psi hat. And here I'm writing F to denote the Fourier basis or the Fourier functions. And this, is, this would be nothing but uh, coefficients. This, so these are scalars, each one belongs to R that multiply in fact, they can actually belong to the complex numbers that multiply uh, my, uh, my Fourier basis or my Fourier functions, okay? Now, note that unlike the regular uh, functions that we uh, used to have, now what we do is we limit our uh, K to belong to minus N to plus N. So here, in fact, what we have is two n plus one uh, functions by which we are representing psi. Okay, and we need this symmetry in order to be able to represent real functions. So, uh, what are our requirements? If psi is real, then obviously I would also like my approximation to be real. Okay, uh, when possible. Um, and what we would like to do is approximate my function in a mean square error sense. I mean, I would like my uh, Fourier way of representing my function to be as close as possible in a mini, uh, mean square error sense. And this is how the error is defined exactly as, as we did before. It would be subtracting from my original function, the approximated function. So you, by now you should know how should this coefficients look like? I mean, what do you assume they would, they would be? They will be the projection of... Uh, okay, so Liran is suggesting that Psi, that my coefficients would be nothing but the projection, and in a moment we'll define a projection of my uh, Psi of T on the uh, beta K F of T. So let's, let's explicitly write the uh, 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 mean square error. I mean, let's try to see what happens when we minimize uh, this one. And, or actually let's write it explicitly and then see that indeed what we will get uh, is that if the only thing that we can do is play with the projection, with the, with the coefficients. Okay. I think that I'm getting the hang of it. Okay, so first of all, just to remind you or uh, show you what is the definition of the inner product between two complex functions. So if I have two complex functions, f of t and g of t, uh, the inner product is defined as the integration over the interval on which they are defined. So it would be, for example, zero and one, and I call this interval delta, uh, uh, where in the interval I multiply f by the conjugate of g. Now, what is the conjugate of a complex number? The conjugate of a complex number, if I have G1 of T, which is real, plus I uh, G2 of T, then the conjugate would be nothing but uh, negating this plus. So this would be the conjugate, okay? So the G conjugate of T would be the one with the minus number here. Um, so what else can I say? I, I can say that the norm of a complex function uh, is, equal to, um, is equal to the inner product of the function with itself, which is nothing but the multiplication of the function with its conjugate. Uh, and if I write it explicitly, and now instead of the real part of f and the imaginary part of f, I write the real of f and i times the imaginary of f. And remember, the real and the i are actually scalar values that 
belong to the uh, real values. I mean, to uh, say all say say R one, but the imaginary is what makes f a complex uh, a complex function. So if I do this multiplication, I'm getting at the end uh, this function, and this function would be real or complex. Real. Real, because I, I uh, the multiplication of the uh, complex times the complex, I mean, i times minus i would be equal to nothing but one, okay? Because i times i would be equal to minus one, and here I have the minus sign, so I have one. And I have uh, i uh, small imaginary times capital I that multiplies r here, an imaginary times uh, i that multiplies with the minus sign, the real there, so they would cancel out. So the norm of a complex function would always belong to the reals. Okay, in fact, it would belong to uh, uh, the uh, reals that are larger than zero. So it would be a real and positive number. And the question is, what can we do with that? Let's continue. Okay, so just a uh, reminder, and I can't see the top uh, part of my screen, so um, I assume that you can, and you will tell me. Um, let me try to navigate my bar here. No, it doesn't work. So uh, when I'm looking at two complex uh, numbers, and in fact also matrices, uh, I have the following uh, property. The complex of a multiplication would, would be uh, the multiplication of the complex numbers. And if I think that what is written here, and I can't really see that, is that if I have A plus B uh, complex, I mean conjugate, it would be uh, the conjugate of the first plus the conjugate of the second. And you can, and you can do that by uh, just, just writing uh, explicitly, uh, uh, defining A as A1 plus uh, I, uh, a2 and multiply it by the b or uh, adding it to the b and immediately you can see that uh, this this uh, equality holds so this is the basic property uh, of uh, of uh, uh, working with complex numbers now why does it help us it helps us because now i can look at the error of a complex of a uh, of a complex um, of a complex uh, definition of a function so here I multiply the error by its conjugate. And uh, let's see if anything interesting is happening, happening here. And this is writing it explicitly. So here I have the conjugate, remember. And now what happens is that I can push the conjugate inside the brackets going from here to here. And since my psi is, um, um, is a real function, the conjugate of a real function is a real function. And what I have is that the conjugate just appears over here. Okay, and at the end of the day, what I end up with, let me go to the next slide. What I end up with is something that looks like that. So I have the, exactly as we did, as we had before, we have the energy of the signal. And I assume that you can see what I'm writing, what I'm writing minus two, the real part of the uh, inner product between, the, um, uh, between my coefficients that multiply uh, the inner product between the function and the conjugate basis, plus the energy of the coefficients. Now, in order to optimize uh, the error, what I need is to take a derivative, is to take the partial derivative of this guy with respect to the, uh, uh, to the coefficients, okay? So in order to minimize uh, my error, my square error, I need to uh, take a derivative with respect to the complex coefficients. Now, since these are co co uh, complex coefficients, I can split them into the reals and the imaginaries, okay? And if I do that and I take this derivative, what would happen is that I have the following. Let me just see if I didn't. Nope. So, just remember what we are uh, what we are after here. 
this is the definition. This is the definition of my error. Okay, this one. And it should approximate my psi function. And um, remember that my psi is a, is, a, um, is a real function that now depends on n plus two n plus one complex coefficients that we denoted as uh, psi minus n that goes through uh, psi zero and all the way to psi n. So again, we, what we would like to do is minimize the square error with respect to two n plus one complex coefficients that actually I can use, I can uh, denote as two because I have two numbers for each and every coefficient, the complex and the real. Uh, and this is how I can actually denote them. I have a real and imaginary number for each and every coefficient. Okay, and we already know that the um, uh, square value of, uh, of, um, uh, of a complex number is uh, nothing but uh, squaring the real and the imaginary. Okay, remember that if I have a square, um, a complex number, then uh, a times a transpose, uh, sorry, n conjugate would give me the, uh, would give me the uh, norm, square norm of A. Okay, what else do we know? We know that if we now um, look at the previous equation and just look at the real part, let me see if I can do that. So now I would just like to look at this part of the equation. Okay, for some reason, Okay, now I move to denoting uh, uh, within the, okay. So if I would just like to uh, work on this part of the equation, then what happens? Let me just try to undo that. And go back to my drawing with, uh, uh, with Zoom. Then what happens is that I have uh, an imaginary part that multiplies uh, these two parts. And at the end of the day, what I would get is that I would get the uh, real times the real part and the imaginary times the imaginary part. And this is what I would be getting at the end. Okay, so all the cross -pod products would cancel out. Okay. Because again, remember that what I'm interested in is just the real part of what is going on here. So if I multiply that part by that part, I would get an imaginary number and therefore I wouldn't uh, care much about it, okay? Okay, um, what we obtain uh, at the end of the day is that the error is equal to nothing but uh, the energy of the signal, very similar to what we have seen before, minus twice uh, this, real number that is written here, plus uh, this would be nothing but the norm of psi k squared. Okay, so let's see, uh, uh, let's optimize now psi with respect to the real and the imaginary coefficients. So if I take a derivative with respect to the real parts, okay, with respect to, the, uh, to these guys, what I get is this equation from which I get immediately that the real part of my coefficient should be nothing but uh, the projection of psi uh, onto the real part of my, uh, of my uh, complex number. Now, if I look at the imaginary part, what I get uh, from this equation is that the imaginary part should be nothing but the inner product uh, between psi and if I would like to put a minus here so that I would be able to equate them. Okay, so in order to write minus here, what I need to do is write minus here, but minus here would be nothing but adding the conjugate there. So in fact, what we end up is that my uh, psi k is equal to nothing but the inner product between my psi of t and my beta k numbers, uh, beta k functions, okay? 
which was exactly what Ivan suggested at the beginning, but still we had to do this uh, exercise for complex numbers. Okay. Um, now I promise you that during this or the next lecture, you would understand why, why we are doing all this uh, effort in order to work with complex numbers. Uh, actually, why to work with the coefficients with the uh, uh, with this kind of family, the Fourier family, and the reason is actually uh, very prosaic in a sense. It has two. It has two reasons. One of them is because uh, the Fourier would help us digest convolutions, but this is something that we will see later in the course. Another one is that if we look at this function as at this beta uh, f of t. Okay, and we have the K over there. And we write them as, uh, so they are the best basis one can think of when trying to represent functions so that the, um, uh, what we call the Dirichlet energy, but uh, let's uh, not get into, so functions whose norm is bounded. Okay, so all smooth functions uh, when I asked the question, what would be the best basis for representing them, uh, what I would end up having is the Fourier as not only the optimal basis, but the unique basis for representing them. And again, representing in the, se in the sense that I can uh, truncate my, uh, my, my um, set of functions at any k, okay? So there would not be any basis which is better than that in sense of uh, the representation error. But we will get to that, okay? It, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, proof, uh, which is after uh, Poincaré. And in fact, uh, Chaim Brazis, a good friend and colleague of us, uh, uh, wrote an interpretation for engineers that can actually be uh, presented in, I don't know, half an hour or something like that. So we'll see that. Okay, so we had uh, the real and the imaginary parts. Um, and and uh, they are actually uh, given by the complex number with uh, complex numbers which are nothing but a projection of my psi onto my betas, okay, onto my, my Fourier betas, okay. And the question now is how? What do we do with that? Um, to that end, let's go next. So now, given these functions, what can we say about the MSE? Okay, what can we see? We say about the mean square error. So the mean square error, if we write the, uh, uh, the terms that we have seen two or three slides ago, uh, is the energy of the signal uh, minus twice the projection of the, um, uh, the projections of the functions onto the, uh, onto the, uh, onto the uh, functions, onto the Fourier functions, uh, plus the conjugate part, okay? Uh, times the conjugate part. And this is nothing but, what you see over here, is nothing but the energy uh, of the coefficients. So we can put it uh, together. And at the end of the day, uh, if we plug in the optimal uh, coefficients, what we get is that, as we have seen before, the error is nothing but uh, the energy of the signal minus the energy of the coefficients, of the optimal coefficients. And the coefficients were nothing but these projections, okay? So this would be nothing but my psi k's, the optimal ones. Okay, so for orthonormal complex basis functions, uh, the optimal coefficients are again, and when I'm saying uh, basis, I refer to the uh, space spanned by these betas, okay? So it would be a basis for the space this, that these betas are, um, are spanning and, and uh, we need to be careful about these basis. We should be able to talk about spanning all possible functions psi of t only when this n would go to infinity. And this is something that we will see in a moment, okay? So um, uh, the autonomal complex basis functions um, and the coefficients are obviously uh, also, uh, um, also complex uh, and they are obtained by an inner product with psi of t. Okay, so how would the reconstructed function would look like? It would look like instead of writing my psi of k, I can now plug in the optimal ones, which is nothing but what you see over here, okay? This is writing everything explicitly. So I take my, uh, 
my basis functions and I run with k from minus n to plus n. And here I have the uh, inner product as my coefficients. Okay, so this would be uh, representing psi of t uh, with the Fourier basis or with the Fourier functions uh, where I use only the 2n plus 1 uh, first functions with twice as much numbers to represent them because I have complex and reals. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now we can actually have the uh, writing again, the error. Uh, what I have is the energy of the signal minus the energy uh, of the coefficients. And these are, um, and uh, these are the Fourier coefficients. I mean, these are the Fourier coefficients and writing them explicitly, uh, you can write them as such, okay? And why do we have a minus here? Uh, conjugate. Yeah, exactly, thank you. Uh, this is exactly the conjugate. So these are the uh, Fourier coefficients and the minus here is because the inner product uh, of psi with my uh, functions uh, is multiplication of the function with its conjugate. Okay, so representing a function uh, using the Fourier complex values, uh, we have uh, the coefficients and we have, uh, if for example, I look at the, if k goes, for example, from zero to one, from zero to n, then I can uh, ask what is the, uh, what is the, uh, I mean, if these are my n's going from minus n to n, then I can ask the question, what would be the relation between the, and this is zero, what is, would be the relation between the function that is uh, represented by this coefficient and the uh, friend uh, coefficient that is represented by uh, the function that uh, belongs to minus k, okay? And what we see is the following interesting relation is that uh, the relation between these two coefficients is that they are conjugate to one another. So in fact, for real num for real functions, what we see is that the uh, coefficient of minus k is the conjugate of the coefficient of uh, plus k and vice versa, obviously, okay? So the coefficient of seven uh, would be the conjugate of the coefficient of minus seven. So instead of having two, times two n plus one, uh, we can actually divide everything for, uh, for real numbers, we can divide everything by two, okay? Up to the, what is going on with the one, probably there should be another one here. But again, uh, the zero coefficient is also uh, real and you can check it out. Okay. Uh, why is the zero coefficient uh, also real? Anyone has any idea? It's the constant. Who said that? But let me. Okay, Barack. So Barack is saying just uh, yeah. So remember what was my uh, what was my um, function for the zero? The function for the zero was e to the power of zero. E to the power of zero is a constant function. Okay, it was my function which is constant. Uh, between zero and one, okay? And this is a real function. So in fact, we can delete the two and this is the number of coefficients that we need, which is interesting, but this is true for real numbers. Okay, for real functions. And this is a property that we can, um, we can use for uh, real numbers. Now, if we uh, rearrange terms again, let me see. If you rearrange terms again, then what we end up is that uh, we can write my coefficients. I mean, we can write my approximation uh, as my coefficients. And at, at the end of the day, if we roll things out, uh, it appears that for real functions, okay, so this belongs to reals. So each and every psi of t belongs to R. Um, and this is, um, uh, so at the end of the day, let's write it like that. Not, not like that, but rather a mapping into R. 
okay so at the end of the day if we roll out my coefficients using the fact that um, um, minus k and k uh, cancel out at the end of the day what we get is a real expansion of my function so what i have here are real numbers and these real numbers are nothing but uh, the Fourier series that you learned in calculus. So there is a relation, there is an intimate relation, obviously, between the uh, Fourier uh, series and the Fourier, what we call the Fourier transform of the Fourier basis. And the, um, and the uh, relation is that the coefficients that we are having at the end of the day are nothing but uh, the inner product of my function with the constant. This would be my first coefficient. And then the inner product of my function uh, with this interpretation of a basis function, okay? Okay, um, if we would like to write it as a, as a, um, as a way of representing my psi of t, then uh, what we can write is that the Fourier approximation or the Fourier series approximation of my function is nothing but a zero that multiplies the constant function. Okay, my function that goes as a constant. And then I have these two reals a k that multiply all the, uh, all the symmetric functions and b k that multiplies all the asymmetric functions. Okay, so we call it them symmetric and asymmetric because if we look at my, if we look at my interval between zero and one, then the asymmetric the symmetric would look like this. This would be all the cosines. And the symmetric would look like that. This would be all the sines. Okay. Okay. Um, and these are my coefficients. My coefficients are exactly uh, the inner product that, um, uh, with the sines and the cosines. And uh, in fact, uh, this is indeed, can you see this line? No. No. Let me try to do something with that. No, I can't. Um, what can I do? Well, what you can basically, uh, so let me just tell you about it. Uh, in fact, what you have is the, um, is the following basis that we can, uh, that we can uh, uh, project our functions on. The first element of this basis would be nothing but cosine of zero times t. Okay, this is the, uh, the constant which is equal to one. The next one would be square root of two uh, cosine of two pi kt. Okay, for all integer k's between minus uh, n and n. And the next one would be square root of two sine two pi. sine 2 pi kt. Okay, so this would be my basis. Um, okay, so what else can we say about uh, this basis? Where did the square root of two come from? The, well, as I said before, what we did here, is oops. What we did here is work out the um, um, uh, the expansion of this guy and plugging in the uh, uh, the coefficients. So this is where it comes out from. Okay. If you want, you can uh, work everything out, and at the end of the day, this is what you get. Um, and in fact, uh, if you go again into your uh, calculus books, what you would get is exactly the uh, is exactly this as a Fourier series. Okay, what what can we what can we uh, say more about it? Uh, we know from our uh, calculus that if we take the limit as the n goes to infinity. Uh, the Fourier series would converge to the um, uh, to my function. So what we can say is that um, is that the the functions psi of t 
uh, defined over the interval zero and one would be uh, well represented as we take n to infinity. Okay, why? Because we learned that uh, if we uh, represent functions with symmetric and asymmetric harmonics, at the end of the day, I would converge to the representation of the function. Now, remember the beginning of the lecture. In the beginning of the lecture, we talked about piecewise constant functions. And you mentioned that uh, I need only n numbers in order to represent them. Let's play exactly the same trick on my functions psi of t. What I'm telling you is that some magician is now uh, saying that uh, what you uh, know is that the projection of your psi onto the harmonics with k larger than some number uh, is equal to zero, which means that there are no uh, harmonic coefficients, there are no harmonics in the uh, in, in psi that are relevant, that are uh, that are that appear over there. Um, if, for example, we go into the human ear and we would like to uh, see what we are listening to. In fact, uh, the human ear is sensitive to frequencies to uh, up to a specific uh, up, up, up to a specific uh, number. OK, so uh, if we're looking at sound waves, uh, this assumption can be uh, relevant. And in fact, in most engineering scenarios, and in a moment we'll see exactly which, uh, this assumption of uh, bounding the, uh, uh, of somehow controlling the frequencies, okay, now I relate to this as frequencies, the behavior of my psi uh, can be assumed to have uh, a property like that. This was exactly analog to my piecewise constant assumption. In the piecewise constant assumption, I limited myself to all functions that are piecewise constant uh, that, and changing value at a specific interval. Here I assume something which is also along the same uh, line, but a little bit more complicated to uh, decipher. And this is the fact that in my function, there are no uh, components that, uh, that are defined as really high frequencies, okay? If I assume that this is the case, that uh, if I assume that for there exists some k which is larger than n0, for which all uh, the projection of my functions, of my set of functions onto these, um, um, onto these harmonics is equal to zero, then what can I say? I can say that representing psi uh, with only uh, two and zero plus one coefficients is exact, okay? Why? Because I've given you as an assumption that uh, this guy holds. Um, now, if tomorrow you would, uh, uh, you would um, try to understand uh, um, harmonics which, for which this uh, condition does not hold, then obviously the approximation, this one would just be an approximation, okay? But for the time being, let's just assume that this condition holds and the question is, what can we do with such an assumption? I mean, is it relevant? When is it relevant? What happens when you know that uh, this holds, but you don't have n zero coefficients? You can actually use only n uh, one, which is smaller than n zero. I mean, what would happen then? I mean, what would happen to the lost uh, signal that cannot be reconstructed? Um, in fact, all the course in the electrical engineering of signal and systems um, not signal systems, introduction to um, of LAS, introduction to signal processing, something like that. Digital signal processing is about what happens in scenarios like that, okay? What happens when I know that my signal has more frequencies, more um, data than the data I can represent? And then the question is, what can I do in this case? I mean, how can I pre-filter it so that it would not sound like um, uh, like some Mickey Mouse effect, okay? Let me, uh, I don't know if you have seen, uh, but in some cases when there is a TV show and uh, somebody is coming with a shirt who has a lot of uh, stripes, okay, I don't know if you remember that and uh, camera is using only 4K, sorry, uh, HD. Okay, I have an HD camera 
and I'm looking from a distance at the guy who is wearing a shirt with many, many thin stripes. And what happens is that these stripes can be thought of as frequency, as spatial frequency, as frequency in the image. And if the imager, if the uh, camera I'm looking at does not have enough uh, frequencies, enough resolution to work with, then I cannot really capture these thin stripes at the shirt of the guy that I'm picturing, okay? And then what you will see is this kind of strange effect. Uh, uh, in classical linear signal processing, it's called aliasing. In, in, um, if it's a little bit more complicated, if the stripes are rotated, then you would see something which is called more patterns. And you would start seeing this kind of artifact that happened exactly because of this reason. But again, as I promise you later on in this course, we'll talk about it. Okay, but for the time being, this is our assumption. And if this is our, if this assumption holds, then um, in our continuous function, this is, uh, the continuous function is completely specified uh, by the two um, uh, n0 plus one numbers that are giving as such, okay, for uh, all of these guys. Okay, so we know that uh, uh, we can actually, um, uh, we can actually represent exactly my real function. And the next question that comes in mind should be, okay, so now assume that I have my continuous function. Okay, this is my function. Okay, this is one and zero, and this is my psi of t. And now I would like to find out my uh, coefficient psi of k, okay? And this is how I represent them. But in order to do so, what I'm telling you is that you're allowed to sample, to probe your function only at two and zero uh, plus one points, okay? So I sample my function here and here and here and here and here and here and here as well. And the number of samples that I'm introducing is two and zero plus one, two and zero plus one such samples. So I sampled my uh, function. And what I know is that the sampled function is equal to my coefficients times the um, uh, basis functions at a specific time, okay? So what can I do? I can uh, list my psi, psi at uh, t1. Uh, well, we mentioned that, uh, yeah, at t0. Okay, these are my n plus one numbers. And these should be equal to uh, here I have a matrix of coefficients and I know exactly what are these coefficients that multiply my vector of Fourier coefficients where uh, the Fourier coefficients go from minus n zero all the way to plus n zero, okay? So I have a function here of numbers and these are the numbers, okay? So for each uh, TL, for each L and for each K, I have an entry in this matrix, okay? And now the question is, can I reconstruct, can I somehow decipher, can I somehow compute uh, these uh, coefficients from this, these samples of the signal? What do you say? What do you think? Any ideas? What do I need in order to be able to find um, these uh, red n plus one coefficients from these red n plus one numbers? We need to multiply by the inverse of the mat left matrix if we have it. Again, who was that? I have from some reason I... Oh, Owen. Owen. If we have the left matrix that you wrote, we can multiply like the inverse of it, and then we'll have the... Okay, so Oren realized that in order to uh, get this, this vector, 
what I need is to invert this matrix and then multiply with the inverse uh, that part and that part, yeah? Yes, I guess like inverse of matrix is too complicated, so there must be a better way. <laughs> no, the inverse of the matrix is actually not that complicated. It's not a Fourier add, matrix. Add yourself, add, add yourself a point here. Uh, this is exactly what we have to do. But we have to justify the fact that uh, this matrix can indeed be inverted, okay? And it appears that if the points by which I'm sampling my function are, uh, uh, have almost uh, uh, any uh, distribution over the real line, in fact, it can be inverted. I mean, I, can, I need to really make an effort in order to uh, have these uh, points uh, such that this matrix would not be invertible. But there is a very, uh, now inverting a matrix is something that can be done. I mean, if I have um, N by N matrix, what is the complexity of inverting a matrix? N Bashley sheet, N cubed. Uh, so the naive algorithm would be N to the power of three, but there are much more uh, efficient algorithm to uh, compute the inverse of the matrix. But this is something that you can, uh, that you can do only once if you care about the coefficients. I mean, if you always sample at these points, then you can pre-invert your matrix and uh, you can actually uh, compute the coefficients for any signal that you are getting into your system, okay? But we are not there yet. I mean, uh, um, so sampling the signal at uh, uh, 2n plus 1 places would allow me to somehow uh, reconstruct back the original signal, okay? Um, so in mm -hmm. fact, this is, um, now, let us simplify things even more. Uh, you can see what is going on above this line? Yes. Okay. So let us simplify things even more and let us now restrict our sampling to be uniformly distributed over the uh, zero one uh, interval so that there would be uh, one over uh, two and zero plus one distant apart, okay? So this would be my delta. And um, um, the samples of my signal, if this is my signal, the sample now of my signal would be evenly or uniformly distributed or regularly distributed over the axis, over the t-axis, okay? So now instead of just uh, arbitrary samples as we did before, now we uniformly distribute them on, uh, over this uh, uh, axis. This uniform distribution has a very uh, nice property. And the nice property is that, uh, first of all, instead of just having some arbitrary number here, what I now have is a well-defined um, structure that I can work with, okay? This exponent has a really nice uh, property. In a moment, we'll analyze that. So again, what we have now uh, is uh, my, um, my function that is being sampled at these re really thinnest and, and uh, accurate points. Now, believe me, it's really, really difficult to sample a function at uh, really zero time, but assume that somebody is allowing you to do that. In fact, if we are thinking about our cameras, okay, if we have a sensor, then the sensor has pixels and each and every pixel is an averaging over everything that is coming from the real world over this section that is coming from the real world. So it's not as if you have a line of sight and you just sample the intensity at this specific point, but rather you accumulate everything that is coming from this section of the world that you are looking at. However, there are some uh, sensors uh, that do allow you to pick up information at, at points. For example, if you think of a leader of a, of a light sensing of depth. So what happens is that you're sending a pulse at a specific direction and then uh, this, this uh, projection hits an object. And then what you get is the distance of your sensor uh, from the object to this line. Now your sensor is moving a little bit and submitting another uh, pulse and then you get the uh, distance of that part. And then you can think of a leader in some sense uh, as a way of probing the depth signal at specific points, okay? 
And then what you need to, uh, okay, so, so this is, uh, this is uh, sampling at points and usually sensors cannot really sample at points. They need to somehow average uh, what is going on about the point. Okay, so now we sampled our uh, signal at equally distant uh, points. And now what we need to do is first of all, delete that. Then there is a procedure that I have to follow in order to jump between, uh, between the slides. Uh, and then what we need to do is, um, what we have is the following uh, equation. We have uh, the values of my sampled function that are given, okay? So this is my function and I sampled it at uh, equally distant points. Now, this is the matrix that I will have to invert. In a moment, we'll see why it is very simple to invert it if the samples are indeed uh, equally distant. And here are the coefficients that I'm after, okay? These are the coefficients in my basis, in my very special basis that I would like to reconstruct, that I would like to extract. So how do these, so what I have here is W to the power of zero times zero. Here I have W to the power of uh, one times zero, which is basically W to the power of zero. So what would be the values of all this row and in fact, all this column, what would be the values, what would be uh, all these values? Ones. Yeah, so the first column and the first row would be something to the power of zero. Something to the power of zero is nothing but one. Um, and in fact, you can show that this matrix is, um, uh, is symmetric if you, we consider the conjugates. Uh, and this W is nothing but taking the unit circle and splitting it into two n plus two and zero plus one uh, splits, which would be nothing but this one. Okay. So again, I have, I'm, dividing my circle into two n plus one uh, splits. And this would be my, the definition of my W. So it would be two pi uh, divided by uh, two n zero plus one. So two pi would be the whole circle returning to here. Now there are some nice properties here. Um, so this would be the two n uh, plus one root of the unity. And the nice property is that um, uh, w to the power of uh, two n zero plus one would be nothing but uh, canceling the denominator and uh, uh, denominator. I mean, the denominator and the denominator, and we end up with uh, uh, with this coefficient, which is nothing but one. And we have this nice property uh, that w to the power of minus n zero is nothing but w to the power of uh, n zero plus one. You can see it because. Uh, because what happens is that the power by each and every coefficient is, is shifting the uh, wheel one knob, one notch to the left, okay? So uh, rotating the knob a minus one times to the, uh, um, uh, this is clockwise, okay? I end up at this point and doing it counterclockwise, I can land at the same point, okay? So again, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the complex plane. This is the um, a complex unit circle. Uh, this is the W, this is my W. And now W to the power of one would, um, uh, would be W. W2 would be this guy, W3 would be this guy, etc., etc. And you can actually also uh, multiply uh, W to the power of W minus one would be this guy. This would be W minus two. So you can see that there, I can get to the same point by, by either rotating my uh, bicycle wheel to the left or to the right, okay? So whoever was riding bicycles um, uh, actually knows that. Okay, now what do I do with this? I can actually write my matrix in a somewhat more convenient way. Uh, so again, these are my, uh, my samples. These are my coefficients, and this is my matrix. And now you can actually see that uh, the entries to the matrix 
are nothing but the um, uh, the power that multiplies that uh, the power of the W of my um, of my one notch in the unit uh, in the unit um, uh, in the unit circle. Okay. Okay. So, what can we do with that? Okay. Um, I think that we will take a break of uh, 10 minutes, but let me just before the break, let me just uh, say something else about this, uh, about this matrix. Uh, again, this, this is the uh, samples at which we are sampling our function. These are the coefficients that we are after. And this is the matrix that uh, we need to invert. Okay, so this is my uh, W matrix. Okay, and the matrix obviously has uh, uh, complex values, and it is easy to see that um, uh, that this matrix has a very beautiful property. That if I take each and every row of this matrix and and uh, take the inner product uh, with each and every column. So remember, what I have here is that the L indices are actually uh, the ones that I'm summing over uh, over. Then um, what I have here is writing it explicitly. I have something like that, which is equal to now writing. Can you see above this line? No. No. Uh, can you see this part? No. Oh, I see. So, and and this part you can see, yeah. Yes. Okay. So what happens is that. Roughly speaking, uh, I have this part, which is, which is equal to M, capital M, where K equals to R, and it is equal to zero when K is not equal to R. It means that the rows and the columns, uh, the rows and the columns of this matrix are in fact orthogonal, orthogonal to one another, okay? And since they are orthogonal up to this factor M that I need to take care of, what I know is that this matrix is nothing but I mean, it, again the conjugate is the inverse it's unitary unitary this is what we call the unitary matrix okay so this is unitary to scale uh, uh, exactly up to one over square root of m or square root of m in a moment we'll see okay so let's take a break what i will do in the break is try to compile it and, and send the um, uh take send the um uh, the text to yahoo and uh, We'll uh, reconvene at uh, eleven at uh, ten uh, fifty. If you don't, uh, ten fifty three. Okay. So let's reconvene at ten uh, fifty three. And in the time being, what I will do is stop sharing uh, and recompile my text and send it to you so that you will have the text yourself. Uh, Yahweh, what was the tool that you mentioned that uh, you use in order to uh, rather than uh, preview? Preview does not work for you? Uh, 
preview works great, but what happens is that when I'm trying to use my uh, iPad and my pen uh, and extend my desktop, uh, from some reason it truncates, I mean, on the, I, on the iPad it truncates the file and it does, I mean, this is a, this is a corner that Zoom did not uh, digest yet. Lonnie, do you hear me? Yep. Um, if you want, you can share your PDF to the iPad and then share the screen of the iPad instead using Zoom from your computer. So this is what I did right now. Using, okay. Using... No. Uh, Not using preview and writing above preview, but actually sharing the screen of the iPad. Oh, so this is sharing the screen of the iPad? Yes, 
I open the PDF in my iPad and then I scribe over it. Let me try to do that. You can over the shell screen in, in the Mac. Uh, it well, I tried to do it the previous time I tried to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened is that um, it couldn't, I mean, Zoom did, could not uh, share the preview, but let me try to, to, to do that again. Maybe I did something wrong. When you share, you need to share from the Mac and choose oh. the iPad as the target. So not, not from the iPad there. Uh, I see, I see what you mean. Now I'll try to do something else. Let's try to beat the bastard. No, from some reason, the uh, iPad does not uh, like to, uh, to share a preview. But what you're saying is that, again, uh, choosing from Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to share a screen in Zoom on Mac, it will give you an option of AirPlay through the iPad. אם תבחר את זה, הוא ירצה להתקין לך את זה שהיא נוזקה על המחשב, אתה אומר לו סבבה? אתה אומר אייפון, אייפד, אייפון ואיירפק. בדיוק, בדיוק. יתקין לך את זה שהיא נוזקה, תגיד לו סבבה. רגע, 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 יש לו גם אייפון ואיר קייבל, זה עדיף לפי דעתי, נכון? האמת שאף פעם לא ניסיתי את זה, יכול להיות שזה היה פה. רגע, אבל פה, מה שאני אעשה קודם כל פה נצא מהזום. בסדר, יש לי פריוויו, שייר, בוא נראה. זהו, אז עכשיו רואים את המסך של האייפד שלך. ואם תיקח את העט, אני מניח שאתה יכול לעשות מרקאפ מעל זה. כן, אבל זה המרקאפ של אייפד של... נכון, אבל אנחנו נראה את זה. אנחנו נראה את זה וזה גם נשאר לך על הדף, כלומר אתה יכול עכשיו לגלול למטה. כן, כן, זה אני לא אהבתי, טוב, בסדר, בוא נראה, סבבה, בוא נראה. לא, זה לא מה שרציתי שיקרה. אז הדרך היחידה להיפטר מזה זה אחרי זה לקמפל מחדש. אתה יכול לעשות גם discard changes, אני מניח, אבל יש אפליקציות פשוט הרבה יותר נוחות מאקרובט כדי כזה לעשות מרקאפ על PDF. טוב, אם אתה מוצא איזה משהו אז תספר לי על זה. Good note ו-notability הם אחלה, הם פשוט עולות כסף. Good note, כן, כן, אז יא ווי, דיברתי על good note באמת, והפקתי עליי שלא לקחתי את זה עד עכשיו. מעולה. Come on. 
יש לך מימין open in acrobat? כי אתה כרגע פשוט בפריוויו של ה-PDF במקום לפתוח את זה באיזושהי אפליקציה. ואם תפתח עכשיו את אקרובט. אדובה, זה? כן, בדיוק. אני מניח שאתה תוכל לפתוח עכשיו את הקובץ משם. open file. ותעשה back לבראוז שם. וואי, למה זה יותר מורכב ממה שחשבתי שזה? On my iPad? אוקיי, ועכשיו אקרובט? לא חושב שזה זה. אבל אם תחזור למייל שהיית קודם, וממש כאילו כבר ראית את ה-PDF שלך, שפתחת אותו, אז בפינה הימנית העליונה של המסך, ממש תפתח את ה-PDF. פינה ימנית עליונה כתוב לך open in acrobat. אוקיי, now we are talking. Thank you. בוא נקווה שזה היה עבוד יותר טוב. לא, זה עבד. טוב, אחרי זה נלמד איך עובדים עם הדבר הזה. ו... או... זה הולך להיות קשה. אתם זוכרים באיזה עמוד היינו? מאה חמישים ושלוש וואלה, נשאר עשיתי משהו לא טוב. אוקיי. This is good because I can see that in uh, both Just a second. Now the computer is really sweating. Okay, so uh, just to remind you, what we did is we uh, sampled our surface, our signal. Uh, uniformly, okay, this was our signal, we sampled it at uniform uh, samples, and for each and every sample what we did is we got a number, and uh, then we, the question was how from these numbers can we uh, extract um, 
can we extract these uh, val these uh, coefficients of representing this function into the Fourier uh, in, in the Fourier basis in in the Fourier functions? And um, now I have to delete everything manually. And and the answer was that uh, if there is a will, there is a way, and uh, it is actually very simple to do that. Um, this is the matrix that we got. Um, I will leave it like that. Um, and this is what we were missing in the previous slide. Uh, and uh, what we got in the previous slide is that in fact, um, the, the, this matrix is almost unitary, okay? Almost unitary, almost in the sense of, uh, almost in the sense of, um, ah, come on. Coefficient. In, in the sense of one over square root of M as far as I remember. So let's see if I remember correctly. And indeed, so this is a symmetric unitary matrix, uh, which means that, um, um, which means that if I multiply it by its conjugate, it, it would be equal to uh, it would be equal to the identity matrix, and this and the conjugate is known as the discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so the matrix, the conjugate matrix, which is nothing but the inverse matrix, and this is why I don't need my naive n cube or a practical or practical n to the power of I don't know something here, which is a really complicated algorithm complexity to invert my matrix, but uh, rather just look at the conjugate, which is in fact a very simple uh, matrix to uh, hold in order to, uh, to take the inverse of my matrix. In fact, I don't even need, so remember that this matrix has uh, n cube uh, coefficient uh, and n squared coefficient, coefficients. Uh, in fact, I don't even need that. We will see afterwards that in order to um, invert this matrix, we need to, uh, we can do it. In fact, I think that you already learned it only with uh, n log n operations. Okay, so it's a quasi linear way of inverting this matrix. And this is in some sense a magical thing because uh, again, we had a huge matrix that we wanted to invert. And at the end of the day, we end up with uh, just a few numbers uh, which, almost the number of samples that I'm looking at in order to uh, get the coefficients in this basis. Okay. Um, so again, what we, what we do is sample my signal at two and zero plus one samples uh, at equally distant um, uh, points. And, oh, oh, I can shift it only like that. And what happens is that um, from these samples, uh, what I can do is get the coefficients by multiplying uh, the samples by this unitary matrix that we call the DFT. Okay, so the DFT of my samples, and I need to somehow normalize my, normalize my samples as well, uh, would be my uh, Fourier coefficients. Okay, so this is my, these are my Fourier coefficients, and this is the way to achieve them. Um, the discrete, uh, um, uh, again, so this matrix, this unitary matrix is known as the DFT matrix. And now you can see everything that I'm drawing here. Okay, what do we do with that? Okay. Now, remember, in order to uh, extract back the function from its Fourier coefficients, what we had to do is multiply my uh, coefficients. So these were my phi f coefficients by the uh, actual functions, okay? So now I know what is the approximation error. The approximation error uh, is something that we have seen before is the energy of, of the coefficients that I subtract from my function. And we said that if we know, for example, that for k uh, greater than n zero, uh, these coefficients are equal to zero. I mean, my function does not have what we call high frequencies, then we know that the uh, reconstruction, I mean, the approximation is exact, okay? Um, is exact uh, representation of, uh, of my function. Now, how many samples do I need in order, to, um, uh, in order to represent my function? This is nothing but my two n zero plus one coefficients. 
Okay, so how many uh, times do I need to sample my functions? This is exactly my two n zero plus one numbers that I need to uh, uh, samples that I need to uh, that I need to sample my function in order to uh, represent it uh, to be able to represent it if it has bounded frequencies where the bound is over capital N. Okay, so again, in this specific case, I know that the MSE error is equal to zero um, and uh, two N zero uh, plus one are the number of samples that I get and I sample them uniformly. Uh, and this is the relative distance between, this is the distance between each and every uh, two, uh, two samples. Okay. Um, so now we are ready to continue. Um, so what can we do with this, with this unitary DFT matrix? Um, um, remember that I told you that if I have, let me go up to this white place over here, that if I have my function and my function is smooth, then capturing, I mean, sampling my function at uh, uniformly distant points I mean, sampling a function at, uh, at the point is a really difficult technical problem. Usually what we do is we somehow integrate the values of the function about the point and the output would be the average of these points. I mean, this is, uh, for example, this is what a pixel would do. This is what um, uh, a microphone, a digital microphone would do. It would integrate over a, over a specific period, usually uniform period, uh, uh, equally spaced period, and then give you the average in that. I mean, this is a, a way of uh, collecting photons or uh, somehow sampling the, uh, the waves of sound that you hear. It would always give you some integration over this point. Now, in order to get there, uh, what we would like to see uh, is look at how the standard basis, remember this was our standard basis, is related to my uh, Fourier basis. So let's use the fact that the DFT matrix is a unitary matrix and take the uh, standard basis. Remember the standard basis was my basis of uh, um, one or square root of M um, that was shifted in, in unit intervals. So this was the first, the second was that one, the third one was that one, et cetera, et cetera. And we multiply as we did with the Haar and the Walsh Hadamard, et cetera. We multiply my standard basis with this DFT unitary matrix. So what we get is a new basis, is a new uh, set of uh, functions. And these functions are given as such. I mean, the first one would be I mean, how would the first one look like? Anyone has any idea? Look at the first Some row. Of, uh, Again? Constant uh, square root of M. Yeah, it, it would be a constant function. So the first one would be a constant. The next one would be more interesting because the next one would be uh, somehow taking some linear combinations of these uh, standard uh, functions. So the first one would be uh, the first one. I mean, would be uh, just adding all these guys together. And since all these guys together are um, something that I can work with, I, I know exactly how the first function would look like, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how the, um, this is how these functions would look like. It would look like, um, I mean, if I'm looking at the kth Fourier coefficient, it would look like that. It would be the first one multiplying uh, the first, um, standard, the first of the standard basis, then I have the second one multiplied by that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is how they would look like. So the ingredients of these uh, of these um, uh, functions would it's called sampled and held harmonic functions over the interval uh, wi uh, um, delta i, which are the cosines and the sines uh, at at these intervals. Okay. So you basically, if we look at the first interval what would happen is that the standard basis would translate it into something which is constant in this interval. And then it would be, um, it would be another constant at this interval and then another constant at that interval. And in fact, we translated our uh, sines and cosines into constant approximations thereof, okay? So this is what happened when trying to translate the standard basis using the, uh, 
the DFT uh, matrix. Okay, so this slide is noisy enough for us to move to the next one. Now, um, what is the relation between the standard coefficients and the uh, new Fourier coefficients? This is the um, standard uh, Fourier coefficients that we uh, refer to. It would be nothing but uh, taking the DFT matrix and multiplying the standard coefficients, okay? So indeed, as we have seen before, uh, in order, uh, if the standard coefficients are given, given as such, Okay, so it would be just the average uh, of the function at each and every interval. Um, and if, uh, for example, we know that my signal is bounded, so I know that my signal uh, after, uh, for k larger than n0 is equal to, to 0. I mean, there are no coefficients uh, for my Fourier after, uh, for, after a specific number of uh, frequencies. Then the classical Fourier coefficients uh, that are computed as such, let me just, that are, and again, so these are the standard Fourier coefficients that are computed as the DFT time the sampled uh, version of the signal. And now the question is what would be the uh, relation between uh, these coefficients, I mean, actually between these coefficients and these coefficients and these coefficients, okay? So this is what we are after. We are after the new Fourier coefficients of uh, DFTing the, um, uh, the, standard basic, uh, the standard basis coefficients, and we want to relate them to the coefficients of, the, um, of, um, of my sample signals, okay? So this is something that we can compute at least theoretically. This is something that we can compute practically. And now we want to, um, uh, to relate uh, these ones that we can compute practically to these ones that we would have liked to compute theoretically. Let, let, me, let us see how they are related. Okay, so let us first of all take my signal, psi of t, and translate it into a new signal that we uh, refer to as uh, psi delta smooth. What is psi delta smooth? Let us look at our signal. So this was my signal psi of t. And now what I do is I replace each and every coefficient, each and every uh, uh, number here with integration between uh, this time t and time t plus delta. So I integrate over all this interval. Let me try to, ah, it replaces everything. Okay, so we now integrate over all this interval. And integrating over all this interval, I replace this number by the integration by the average over all this, uh, over all this interval. Now I move to the nearby point and I integrate over all this interval. And I move to the nearby point and I integrate over all this interval. So each and every point is replaced by an integration over the function uh, for an interval which is equal to delta, okay? So it's like a look ahead. I land at the point and I look at all the values at this interval and I replace the value at this point by this interval. Now, if I started from a function that looks like that and my interval is large, then what would happen is that I would get a smoother version of this function. So I would get something that looks like that, okay? So we can relate to this operation as a smoothing operator. I mean, integrating is in a sense uh, averaging and in a sense, uh, what we are doing is uh, smoothing this operator. What happens when Delta goes to zero? Any ideas? We get the usual uh, signal. Again, who was that? Uh, me. Me, me is nice too. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah, again. My name is again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, me, me is. Uh, I mean, I don't see who is speaking, and uh, I'm uh, watching four screens right now, so it's uh, a little bit uh, challenging, even for me. So Yagel is saying that when delta is going to zero, what happens? Say, say it again. Um, we're going to get uh, the original signal since okay, we're so averaging when, over when, a very small interval. 
Yeah, exactly. So when delta is going to uh, zero, what I'm going to get back is uh, psi of t. Now, what happens when uh, the interval would uh, be equal to one? To the whole interval, what would happen then? We average the signal. The average. Yeah, we just average the signal. Okay. Okay, so uh, now we are at a position where we can, we can actually uh, do interesting things. And these interesting things are actually asking the question of what is the relation between the averaging and the standard basis. So if we are looking at the average at, at this smooth signal, and we just look at the first point of the signal, okay? So it would be just integrating over the first interval. In fact, it would be equivalent to my size and the, okay, and, and the next goes for the second uh, interval and the next go for the second. So if I take, and then the mth minus one would be uh, the last part of integrating over my signal. So if I now sample my smooth function at equally distant points, what I would have received is basically projecting into what? The standard basis. Thank you, Sean. So it would be projecting onto the standard basis. So I'm taking my function. I've smoothed it a little bit. So now it would look like that. And now I sample it at these points. And these samples would be nothing but, by definition, um, uh, the projection onto the standard basis. OK, so we know the relation between the smooth and the standard basis. This is, I would say, almost trivial, especially after you explain it. Um, now, we already know that uh, by definition for a narrow band, uh, for a um, uh, function that can be re represented only by the uh, first n zeros uh, plus and minus coefficients of the Fourier, then uh, this is equal to zero for the rest of them. And the question is, does this condition also hold for the smooth version of t. Now, the answer is not trivial. It's not trivial when you think about it for a moment. But in a moment, we, you will see that it is, uh, because if I already know that this function is somehow uh, limited in the number of frequencies that it has, then smoothing it further uh, would not create new frequencies. Let's see how it works. So this is by definition, uh, psi is smooth, the smooth version of psi. And what we'll do right now is we plug in uh, its expansion by the, um, and its projection onto the uh, Fourier basis. And this is an equality uh, because we know that beyond N zero, uh, there are no coefficients to psi. So until now, everything is fine. Now, what we will do is we'll play with the sum and the integration parts so we'll replace the order and uh, we'll shift all the coefficients out of the integration because you don't uh, need them there. And what happens is that, I mean, this one is a scalar, so you don't need it inside integration, so you can pull it out. So what happens is that what we are getting is exactly, uh, is exactly that. Um, we get integration uh, over delta of my exponents, okay? I mean, the only thing that goes uh, through integration now with, with respect to psi would be my exponents. Now, integrating over the exponents is something that we can do. I mean, we learned it in high school. Uh, I just need to pull the uh, coefficients that multiply my integral um, and, and divide by it. So here I have a division by these, uh, by these constants. And at the end of the day, what I have, let's, shift to what I get is something that would look like that. I would have uh, my coefficients of the Fourier that multiply my exponent. And then I have this term. Now this term is nothing but after some, I mean, after some manipulation is nothing but a sign divided by the argument of the sign and the complex number. Now, what we'll need to show is that uh, these things are actually uh, related. So let's, let's first of all analyze it. 
So obviously the smooth version of the, of the bounded in sense of uh, uh, projected onto the Fourier coefficients um, can be completely described by the first n zero pl plus one coefficients, okay? So we can uh, express psi smooth of t uh, by the first uh, n plus one coefficients of the Fourier, okay? Um, the smoothing operation kept the function within the bounded in the sense that uh, if I now take this function and, and uh, look at its expansion uh, with respect to the Fourier, then I don't need more than n zero coefficients. Okay, I can uh, represent it accurately. Um, what else can I say about that? Uh, so again, what we say is that my psi smooth, uh, pi, uh, psi smooth is K band limited. Now let's see what happens when my sampling, when delta goes to zero. When delta goes to zero, what would happen is that um, we know that sync, that sine divided by its argument, I mean, sine of X divided by X uh, in the limit where X goes to zero is equal to one. one. And what happens to uh, this part? You know, what is the limit of one, one minus cos X? The lim is where X goes to zero is equal to in a very similar way, I mean, you can show that it is equal to zero. So the complex number would vanish and the uh, sign would actually contribute its value. And then in the limit where the smoothing goes to zero, what we obviously get is back the uh, Fourier uh, coefficients, okay? So the smoothing operation did not do us any harm. Uh, it, still, it kept us within the, uh, within the regime of bounded uh, limited functions. And in fact, what we will be able to show later on is that if we have any, if we look at the coefficients between n0 minus n0 and n0, if they would be bounded and I multiply it with any other function, then this multiplication would basically truncate all the high frequency of this function and the result would be kept within this band limited uh, regime, okay? And in fact, if we look, uh, let me just translate what we have just done here into a different language. And this is the language of convolution. And I will define convolution formally, but for the time being, I would just like to mention it so that uh, it would penetrate into your vocabulary. And then uh, when we learn about it officially, you will be able to decipher it. So what we did here is we took a signal and we shifted a, a, a window over the signal and shifting and, and the output was a new signal, okay? A smoother version of the original signal. Shifting this uh, window over the signal is called convolution. So we say that we convolve the original signal, the original function by a new function, which is, which is defined like that. We saw that if we take the coefficients of this function, and we say that they are limited between minus n zero and n zero, then we get something. We can uh, go back and forth between the coefficients and the signal uh, by uh, projecting it onto the Fourier functions. Now, what happens when I take this function and uh, ask what would, what would be the Fourier coefficients of projecting this function? It appears that what I would be getting is nothing but something that looks like that. I mean, if I look just at the real part, it would look like a sink. This is how a sink look like. This is sine of X, sine, sine of T divided by T. And obviously it would never be bounded because, uh, because the, so these would be samples of this function would be my coefficients. So if I would look between minus N zero and N zero, uh, I would not be able to bound uh, this kind of a function. And the reason is that if I look at the transition between one and zero, 
this is a really sharp transition. Okay, and this really nice, this really sharp transition creates these frequencies that would always exist. But when I, uh, when I apply this function onto my original function that had bounded frequencies to begin with, it appears that uh, it would not be able to generate, to construct new frequencies, okay? And this is something which is interesting. This is a property that we would use. And, um, um, and, and in fact, uh, there is a nice relation between uh, these two because if, for example, but we'll keep it to later, to a later discussion. Okay, so what can we do right now? We have seen that we can write uh, the smooth um, coefficients, I mean, the uh, Fourier coefficients of the smooth signal as the DFT of the standard basis, okay? So taking the DFT of the standard basis would be nothing but the coefficients of the smooth version of the signal. And uh, we have seen the formula uh, for representing uh, the, smooth, the smooth coefficients is nothing but taking the uh, Fourier coefficients of the signal and multiplying them by these coefficients, okay? And obviously, as uh, delta goes to zero, we uh, see that the coefficients converge to the uh, coefficients of the Fourier for all k, and therefore the smooth version obviously would converge to the, uh, to the true uh, to the uh, original version of the signal. So again, uh, what we have is the coefficients of the small signal are equal to uh, these coefficients uh, of the standard basis in the Fourier that multiply uh, the coefficients of the uh, original signal in the Fourier. And again, as delta goes to zero, we have the coefficients converging to the coefficients. Um, and this is repeating it again in all possible variations, okay? So you are welcome to go over the slides, but basically what we showed is exactly what I hand waved uh, just in the slide before. Okay, so now uh, we are ready to explore new territories. And let me just uh, tell you what we have done. We have seen a signal, okay? And let's assume that it is uh, considered only between zero and one. We have projected it into the exponent. Uh, we called it W. We sampled it at endpoints two and zero plus one points. Okay. And by sampling our signal psi of t at two and zero plus one points, uh, we have been able to project the signal um, into the um, exponent. So there have been two pi t divided by n to n zero plus one. And here I had my k. Okay, so this was my family. And projecting my sampled signal at n zero plus one points into this uh, n minus n zero to n zero, n zero functions, we have been able to represent back the function psi of t. Again, assuming that uh, there are no frequencies at higher, uh, at, at uh, k larger than n0. Um, now let's see where these exponent or exponents are coming from before we get into convolutions and stuff like that. And to that end, what we will do is uh, uh, claim the following claims. Now, the moment I will write gradient, just refer to it as d over dt or d over dx. The moment I will write Laplacian, uh, Laplacian just refer to it as uh, the second order derivative with respect to t, so that you will, uh, you will not have difficulties of understanding. Think of everything as a two-dimensional, um, two-dimensional, as a one-dimensional signal, but Everything that we will say in this, uh, in this lecture would also apply to any dimensional, to signals in any dimension, okay? So uh, what we will prove now is that the, um, the Fourier basis, okay, this uh, e to the power of something um, with our k goes from minus n zero to n zero. And in fact, you can take n zero to be as large as possible will we'll denote this basis as E 
rather than uh, rather than uh, beta. So it would be either e of t or beta of t. And we will extract this basis as the eigenbasis of this operator. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if I take the second order derivative with respect to t of my basis, it would be equal to some, to some scalar, okay, times the basis. Uh, there is also a minus sign here. Okay, so this is called the natural basis, okay? And this would be nothing but the Fourier. And um, I will also give you an intuition afterwards of why this works, but you can think of the second derivative of a unit circle as just some sort of rotating of shif shifting the, the complex circle, okay? But before that, let us have some uh, preliminaries. So again, uh, what we would do like to prove um, um, is the fact that um, among all functions who are bounded in their in the energy of their norm of the gradient, okay. So this is one way of looking at all smooth functions, all functions uh, for which, when integrating over the gradient, uh, the gradient energy is uh, is bounded, okay. Um, so this is a family of functions and we denote this family of functions as psi omega. Okay, so this is a, a very specific family of function. Now this is, the, the issue is that unlike, in, uh, if we think of the previous case as just truncating uh, frequencies and since we are dealing with frequencies, it, would, it was almost straightforward. But now I'm attacking this problem from a completely different point of view. I'm telling you that if uh, the set of functions that we would like to explore are those that uh, satisfy this condition. Then uh, let beta i be the basis of our all smooth bounded domains in Rn. But again, think about all my betas that are defined between zero and one and define the error like that. So the error is the usual error that we are uh, defining as usual. So it would be the projection of psi over beta i times beta i. So this would be the optimal way of representing my function in a truncated way, okay? So I'm considering only the first k elements. So we would like to find the beta that minimizes the error for all k uh, larger than uh, one and for all psi that belong to this family. So if previously what we did is we optimized epsilon. And then what we did is we just asked what would be the best coefficients and what would be the best, um, uh, given a beta, what would be the best coefficients. Now we would like to optimize for beta itself. And in order not to be uh, as general as possible, we limit ourselves to this kind of a family. Any questions about that? I would like to, I mean, I would, I'm, I would be happy to say it uh, five more times because this is a really important point now. So again, I have all my functions uh, that are defined like that and without loss of generality, we, we also we will consider all functions that getting zero at the beginning of at the end, but this is not really important for our discussion. And for all these functions, I know that the, in, the integration over the gradients, uh, d phi psi over d psi, is smaller than one, okay? So this is every, everything that I know about, this, about these functions. So they are not crazy, they are bounded. And now the proof would be, let's see what the proof is about. The proof would be that indeed the Fourier would be this basis and not only that it would be uh, an optimal basis, it would be the only basis. So there is optimality and uniqueness, okay? Now uniqueness, you will have to prove at home. Uh, and the proof is basically fundamentally very similar to what I will prove to you. And the um, optimality is what I will prove today. And if you would like to prove it for discrete signals, then um, there is a paper that we have written with Freddie Brookstein and uh, Chaim Brazis and Jonathan Aflalo. And for the more general case, uh, Chaim Brazis later on wrote a paper 
and this is and the proof is based on, on, on his paper. So you will have to read his paper in order to prove the uh, uniqueness. So first of all, about Dirichlet energy, uh, I mean, about what is Dirichlet energy, it, it is nothing but the norm uh, of the uh, gradient of the signal. And the norm of the gradient of the, of the, gradient of, uh, of, us, of the signal is defined as follows. Now we are uh, dealing only with real uh, functions. And in one dimension, I can actually write it as such. And if I do integration by parts, uh, then I have uh, psi, this is V prime that becomes V here. And this is U prime that, that is state U. So I know that I assume that the derivatives of my function at the boundary are equal to zero. I mean, okay, I assume that my function looks like that. This is, these are the boundaries. Um, then uh, this, this one would cancel out. I mean, this part would be equal to zero. And what I end up with is nothing but that, okay? Now, what is that? This is the inner product between Psi and the second derivative of Psi with respect to T, okay? And by the way, this construction is a very useful way of defining the Laplacian, because if I'm looking at the inner product of, um, and in fact, it is the, the, the uh, most natural way of defining an inner product, et cetera, et cetera. But if I'm looking at uh, the, the inner product of the gradient of the function with, with itself, then the idea is to uh, somehow take the gradient and move it here and the gradient of the gradient, or actually the div of the gradient is nothing but the divergence or uh, is nothing but the Laplacian and you have the minus sign here. So again, the inner product of the uh, of the, uh, the Dirichlet energy or the inner product of the gradient of this itself gives me nothing but uh, this uh, this relation. And as I told you before, you can take uh, this operator, the second order derivative according to time, and ask which functions would actually satisfy this condition. Okay. So again, this is the minus sign of the Laplacian. And I would like to uh, ask what would be the um, eigenfunctions of this operator. Now, can you see why this is Fourier? Can anyone see why this is Fourier? Yeah, yeah. because uh, the sine and cosine uh, will have this property. Okay, so if I take the second derivative, who was that? Liran. Liran? Another point. So if I take the second order derivative of a cosine or a sine, what would happen is that I would get a constant times the sine or the cosine, okay? So this is immediately obvious that if I take the second order derivative with respect to the time of the sine of the cosine, I would get the right constant times the sine of the, or the cosine. So um, writing it in a more general uh, form, so instead of just writing uh, minus uh, d over dt squared. I'm writing it like that. But again, this is, uh, and th this is just to show you that it doesn't hold only for one dimensional signal, but it would hold for any dimensional signal, okay? So I can write this operator and these are called the harmonics or the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. Um, and uh, uh, these eigenfunctions are equal to zero at the boundary. Again, this is something that uh, we assume without loss of generality. And let's also order them so that uh, I order the eigenvalues from zero to uh, in an increasing order, okay? And we say that the spectrum of the operator is simple if uh, there are no two eigenvalues that are the same. It's not necessarily always the same, but assume that uh, in our case, it would be the same. So I'm saying that this is a simple, a simple spectrum. If I don't have lambda i equal to lambda i plus one. So it would always have uh, the, um, smaller, uh, the smaller order. So there is a well-defined order between the eigenvalues. So let's assume that this is the case for our interval. And let's, uh, and let's see what else can we say about it. A warm up. Uh, so if again, we write the inner, the, the um, energy of the gradient of the function, 
uh, than we have seen from the previous slide that we can write it as psi times minus uh, in a product that with minus the Laplacian. And now we write it explicitly as, um, as by projecting each function into the uh, eigenvalues of the Laplacians, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So here I have, let's change it into J just to show that we have two different uh, quantities here. And here, instead of plugging uh, psi, I'm, I have uh, minus the Laplacian of psi. Now, what I know here is that I have some scalars that multiply these eigenfunctions, and I have another set of scalars that multiplies these eigenfunctions. And the inner product is basically integrating all of them. Okay, so I have some integration over, say, dt of uh, something that multiplies di and another something of t and another something that multiply, and obviously I have some i, and another something that multiplies ej of t. But what do we know about ej and ei? Orthonormal. They are orthonormal. So only eis would survive. So only when they are equivalent to one another, they would survive. So what I end up having is that I have the projection over uh, the i's, which are the coefficients, times the projections onto the ei's, which are the coefficients that uh, match those coefficients, okay? And if we continue, what, what I can do is now apply again the integration by parts in order to move the Laplacian from psi to e. Okay, so I move the Laplacian from psi to e. Now I know that um, uh, this is equal to nothing but lambda i e i, so I can plug it in. And what I end up having is that I have now e i, uh, lambda i is a constant that I can pull out of this equation. And what I end up is nothing but uh, lambda i times the inner product of uh, psi uh, times EI squared, okay? So I can, in fact, uh, write the uh, sum, the norm of psi of T prime as being equal to what is, to what is written here, okay? Okay, now we have, have all preliminaries in order to um, uh, make our point uh, solid. I have a question. Sure. Isn't the lambda I should be conjugated? No, first of all, um, okay. So if we go back, these lambdas, since this is a positive, well-definite, well um, uh, well-defined, well -defined, um, well-posed uh, operator, all the lambdas are in fact real. Okay, they are real and they're positive. So you're right, it would be the conjugate, but the conjugate is in fact uh, the real value. Okay, so okay. for the second order derivative, it would always belong to the uh, real, to the reals. So if we would like to be formal, yes, it would. Ne I need to write, I need to think about it right now. I would probably need to write conjugate here and here. But again, since we are actually um, uh, dealing with, but since lambda is, is uh, real, I have no problem with that. Okay. Okay, so what is the main theorem uh, of this uh, of this uh, of this lecture of this part of the lecture, uh, the first part is called whale theorem, and it is actually quite trivial to prove. And this is the following: uh, for every k larger than one, we have that for any psi that belongs to my family. Okay, so now I'm looking only at those that uh, for which uh, psi prime squared. Uh, is smaller than one, only for those functions. Then I have the error, which is defined as psi minus the projection of psi over the uh, natural basis over the um, the composition of the of the um, 
uh, d squared over dt. Okay, only uh, is smaller than uh, the norm of the gradient of psi squared divided by lambda k plus one. Okay, so this is why we actually ordered the lambda in an uh, ascending order. Okay, this is why we actually order them in an ascending order. So each lambda should be larger than uh, the previous one. And this is why the more k's we add, the smaller the error would be because when lambda goes up, uh, the error would decrease because lambda is in the denominator. So let's prove that. And the proof again, as I told you, is relatively simple. What I have is that if I look at the error, it would be nothing but the residual uh, of my projection of psi onto the EIs. I mean, what I do here is I can write psi as the sum from i equals one to infinity of the coefficients projected onto the uh, eigenfunction, onto the uh, functions. And if I take it to infinity, uh, what I get is that subtracting only this part of the sequence, I'm getting this part. Okay, so there is a check mark on the on check mark on this equality. But we only, uh, uh, what is going on here? I, I need to take the inner product of these colors with these, let's call them vectors or these functions with themselves. Now, we, we remember that these functions are in fact uh, orthonormal. And since they are orthonormal, they would communicate only with themselves. So. Uh, e i would only communicate with e i. It would never communicate with e h. The inner product would be zero. So I end up with this equality. So the uh, so the error would be nothing but the projection of psi over the rest of the domain squared over the rest of the eigenfunctions e i t, where i is equal to k plus one to infinity. Now at the other end. Uh, let's see uh, what is uh, what is going on here. We know that I mean we have proved in the previous slide. Uh, this is what we proved in the previous slide. So we have that uh, the norm of the uh, gradient of the function is equal to this guy. Okay, this is what we proved in the previous uh, in the previous uh, slide. But what we know is that the lambdas are going in an ascending order. So obviously, if I first of all, if I just truncate this sequence, okay, if I just take uh, the residual, the uh, part of the sequence where i goes from k plus one to infinity, what I get is this um, is this uh, inequality. Why? Because I've thrown away some positive numbers. I mean, all of these are positive numbers and obviously uh, the lambdas are positive real numbers. Everything is positive and real. And if I truncate it, then obviously I get this equality. At the other end, remember that my lambdas are, um, are uh, going in an ascending order. So if now instead of the lambdas that are uh, starting from lambda k plus one, then lambda k plus two would be larger than lambda k plus one. Lam lambda k plus n would be larger than lambda k plus one. So if I limit myself and I only take lambda k plus one that would multiply all these numbers, then I can pull it out of the summation. And in fact, I have this uh, inequality. So again, I've replaced all the big lambdas with lambda k plus one. And this is where I get this equation. And in fact, if I take this part, and that part and divide them by lambda k plus one, what I get is the is a proof of the above uh, well uh, theorem, okay? So this is can relatively I, uh, easy uh, to prove. Can I ask a question? Of course. Can you maybe explain again the, I'll, sh I'll just show it on the screen, this one? You sure. said the orthonormality? Sure. So let's, uh, let's uh, from some reason, oh, yeah. So let's do it explicitly. What I have here is uh, integration over, let's call these numbers, I don't know, alpha i 
EIT. Okay, and, and, and I'm summing over all the I's. Uh, inner producted with what? With beta J. So this would be the beta J EJ of T. Et, and here I have a sum by J, okay? And these sums go from uh, K plus one to infinity for both I and J. Now, remember that the inner product, so this would be, I mean, uh, this is the inner product, so, sorry, so let me just see how I can do that. Okay. This is the inner product, okay? So this is defining the uh, alpha i's. The i t with alpha, with beta j, e j t. In fact, the alpha and the betas are the same, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Okay, and here I have uh, the sum over i and j. Now, Remember that when I'm, so the coefficients, the constants, I can pull out of the equation and they become, these are the constants and they become, let me clean it a little bit here. And they would become, uh, uh, alpha i beta j. And here I have integration over EI of T, EJ of T, DT. Ah, come on. This is not what I wanted. The nice thing about it is that now uh, all the equations are, I mean, all the scribbles that I do remain. Okay, and here I have dt. Now, what is this? This integration is nothing but delta ij, okay? It would exist only for delta ij. When, uh, when this part exists, I mean, when, when ei is equal to, when i is equal to j, only then I will get one. Otherwise, I would get zero. So, in fact, what I would get here is nothing but uh, sum of i, now I can i and j replace by just i, of alpha i times alpha i, which is nothing but alpha i squared. And this is nothing but alpha i squared. I hope I was able to denoise. Was it okay? Um, yes, I think so. Um, okay. So again, the only thing Can I, I did here is, question? again, can I also ask a question? Of course, of course. Um, where in the proof did you assume that the, the Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet energy is bounded by one? I didn't, yet. Oh, okay. Wait, 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 it will be, it will be done. Okay, okay, let me tell you where, here. It needs to be a finite number, let me show you. It needs to be a finite number. If it's not bounded, then I cannot write this. Obviously, uh, the residual would always, it, it would be trivial. So uh, in order to uh, make some meaning out of it, I need that here I would have a number, okay? Otherwise yeah, I cannot, I mean, it would be, uh, it would, but, but again, I didn't use it for, for the proof. I didn't use it in any, in any step, okay? So what would be the second theorem? And here I will need this uh, part. Um, the second theorem would, would uh, and this is where the, the relatively complicated trick comes into play. The second theorem says that there is no K larger than one, larger or equal to one, and there is no alpha, which is smaller than one, and this is important, such that I can find uh, and, and no basis beta i such that I can find a more tight error, okay? So now if alpha is smaller than one, it means that there exists another basis that would allow me to get a smaller error, okay? 
And if there is no such basis, it would mean that my E of I of T is, is an optimal one, okay? I cannot find another basis that would give me uh, that would give me alpha, that would give me a smaller error than what well theorem provided for me. Now, these are the eigenvalues of uh, decomposing minus uh, square root of uh, T, the Laplacian, okay? These are these eigenvalues. So with respect to these eigenvalues, I cannot find a better basis uh, to uh, represent my function with. By the way, it doesn't mean that EI is unique. I mean, probably uh, you could still prove that when alpha is equal to one, there is still another basis, which is different than EI, which would also give me this bound on the error. But I cannot claim that there is uh, another, another basis, which I don't know is easier to work with, uh, whatever. And in order to prove that EI is in fact unique, and there is no other basis but EI, this is part of the proof that you will have to do at home. And I will simplify things for you and you will be able to prove it uh, only when lambda I is always less than um, lambda I plus one. Okay, a simple spectrum. So what is the Poincaré trick? And I refer to, um, uh, to Brazil's paper in the end. So first of all, assume there is. Assume there is a basis like that and let's, uh, defined our psi to be something that lives in the span of uh, uh, e1 e until ek plus one, okay? Now, remember that uh, if we now project psi onto the beta i, um, there is an other, uh, there is a linear system that um, uh, this is an under, sorry. So what we would like to do is define my psi so that the projection onto the first beta i's would be equal to zero. So it would exist uh, only, um, only at, the beta, at the beta k plus one, okay? So the first one would, uh, would be equal to zero and all the energy of the signal would, be, uh, would belong to the next betas, okay? So, uh, there is obviously, um, so this is an underdetermined system and uh, obviously we can find, uh, so th there are K equations and K plus one unknowns uh, and, the, uh, and there is a, a solution to the CI. So I can actually represent this uh, uh, function uh, in, this, in this basis, okay? So again, this was my selection, my construction of uh, Psi. And I'm telling you that when I would like it to be such that uh, when projecting it onto the first k elements of beta, it would be equal to zero. What can I say now? What I can say is that if I, if I look at psi projected onto, this, uh, onto these vectors, since I know that the projection onto the first vectors is equal to zero, then what I basically get is the whole energy of psi, okay? Why? Because this is how, how I constructed it. At the other end, I know that the uh, that the energy of psi is given to me by these coefficients. Why? Because this is by definition how I construct psi. So it would be the coefficients of projecting psi onto the, um, onto the, um, uh, onto the natural basis, okay? Okay, so now what I do is I insert psi into this equation. Okay, so I inserted the psi that I've chosen into this equation. And what I get is that on the left, let me denoise it a little bit, just for me. What I get is uh, now I can multiply both sides of the equation by lambda k plus one. So I have lambda k plus one that multiplies this part, which I've shown you to be equal to that. So what I'm getting here is lambda k plus one times c uh, i squared, which is smaller than, now I have here the norm, I have here, sorry. I have here the norm of the signal, uh, which I know to be equal to, um, uh, to lambda i ci squared, 
okay? Now, I know that lambda i's are um, ordered in a non-decreasing order, so I can actually, um, and, and this, is, this goes for k equals one to, to for, for i equals one to k plus one. So I can pull the lambda k, uh, lambda k plus one out of the summation and still keep the, um, the less or equal. And now the question, okay, that I can ask is, now here uh, we use the fact that, in fact, that we can write uh, my bounded signal as such. So here I plug this part. Now, this inequality would hold for alpha smaller than, uh, for also alpha smaller than, uh, uh, smaller than one, only if the sum of the energy of the signal is equal to zero. Otherwise, uh, I would not be able to, again, I have um, some x, which is smaller or, or equal to alpha times x. So equality, I would be able to get this, uh, and, 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 and this one, the alpha is smaller than one. So this would hold only for, only if x is equal to zero, okay? So what I know is that the sum of the ci is equal to zero, which means that all the ci is equal to zero for all i's, which means that this is a contradiction, a contradiction to the assumption that uh, I can actually build um, a function, like a set of functions like that. So this is a proof of optimality. Now, let me uh, go over what I think that you should do at home. And let me uh, tell you uh, what would be the trick. So we proved optimality. Now what we need to prove is, uh, um, um, is uniqueness. And uniqueness is, is the following. Uh, let the orthonormal basis beta i satisfy for all k, uh, satisfy this equation. Uh, then what we'll do is prove that beta i must be equal to uh, e i. And uh, for that, Uh, what you need to do is prove that beta i, uh, that the inner product between beta j and uh, e l uh, is equal to zero for every j which is smaller than l, which means that the two bases should align. Now, what you should do is go over the um, uh, uniqueness proof in three, which I will show you uh, here before. Okay, so this would be this paper. So you should go and read this paper. It is, it is written in really clear and uh, straightforward manner. So everything we learned in this course is actually embedded there. But what is even more important to my, in my view is that is the following claim. Okay, so this is something that you will have to do at home. And, um, and um, by the way, we will redo Borisis in class along with the functional maps in the tutorial. Okay, so, First of all, uh, if anything was unclear, then uh, Tom and uh, Yahweh will, uh, will go over the proof in class. So if anything was vague until now, uh, you would have to go through it again. Uh, but what is really, really interesting about it is that if you have any domain, okay, you have any domain on which you define your functions, your coordinates, whatever, okay? So this would be your omega. omega. In any dimension, if you have a definition of a Laplacian, and by the way, this can also be a graph. I mean, your, your domain can also be a graph. Okay. If you have a definition of a, of a gradient and a Laplacian, then what you can do is decompose your Laplacian into your EIs and lambda EIs. And now start to analyze your information, your data or whatever in this space. Now, if the data is smooth in the fact of uh, taking the gradient of your functions and somehow bounding them, and this is a property that would almost always happen, then you can say that representing your information in this domain uh, is optimal in, in sense of representation. Now, everything that is done in, in uh, spectral analysis 
in spectral analysis has to do with projecting functions onto these uh, onto these uh, eigen vectors. In fact, you can think about a Fiedler vector, which is something that can be used in order to um, say whether um, your uh, graph is connected or your domain is connected or disconnected. And uh, you can actually take it into uh, new domains, into new spheres and do your analysis. In my business, what we do is we look at, uh, at uh, for example, uh, two objects, for example, let's, uh, let's think of one shape, which is defined like that. And another shape, which is defined like that. Okay, a hand in two configurations. Let's do like that, okay. Now, these two domains, omega, this is omega one and omega two. And in fact, you can think of these omegas as being completely, as living in completely two different spaces. So until now we had our T axis as the common denominator for all the functions, but now assume that you have one T and you have another tau, which looks at a completely different set of functions. And now you can ask the question of how do you relate these functions to these functions? Uh, to that end, uh, I will go in the tutorial and um, uh, next lecture into something which is called functional maps. And this is a really nice idea of uh, assuming that here I have my Fourier basis, um, let's call it E1. And here I have another Fourier basis, let's call it E tilde one, E tilde I. And then the question is, what is the relation between projecting the Psi of T onto the EIs and the Psi tildes of tau uh, onto the E tilde Is? And when you are trying to compare between shapes like that, this is a really important uh, observation. And this observation relates to something which is called functional maps. Uh, but again, let's keep it, um, as a, as a footnote for a moment, we'll talk about it in the next lecture. Questions? Yes. Uh, where have we shown, or if we did, uh, that the spectrum is, uh, is discrete of the Laplacian? Uh, we haven't, but for that, what you will uh, need to uh, go back to your function analysis or calculus, uh, uh, calculus, uh, classes and claim that if you have your domain to be bounded, if you have a bounded domain, then the spectrum, then you get a discrete spectrum. Otherwise, what um, uh, Barak is asking is why should we just uh, get lambda i of t? I mean, why should it be a discrete set? Okay, this was your question? Yeah. So if you have a bounded domain, if your domain is bounded, then uh, lambda is uh, discrete. Um, we can prove it. I mean, it's not that complicated, but then it would really diverge uh, from what is going on in this course. So since we are always working with bounded domains, our, uh, in fact, I, comp I think that compact is enough. Your uh, lambda are, is a discrete set. And this bounded domain, by, by the way, can be periodic. So if I'm looking at a sphere, then this is a bounded domain. If I'm looking at a torus, then this, from my point of view, is a bounded domain. Okay, so as long as it is periodic um, and compact, uh, then, then your spectrum would be discrete, a discrete set. More? Nice. Maybe, maybe I missed something, but uh, we showed that EIs is the optimal and the unique basis. Uh, where did we say that EI is the Fourier basis? We didn't. Okay, we will. We will we'll, we'll prove it. This is, right. this is the easy part. Okay, we said, we mentioned that, and somebody got a point for that, uh, when we said that, look, at the end of the day, what we're looking at is something like that. The second derivative of something, EI of T equals to some constant times EI of T. And which functions 
can you take second order derivative of and it would, it would uh, go back to the same uh, function. The only ones are the trigonometric functions. I mean, the, the, taking the derivative of a cosine is a sine and then the sine is a cosine up to a minus sine, okay? So from that perspective, we did prove, so this is hand-waving proof that these are the signs and the cosines. Uh, for the more general domains, uh, for example, for a sphere, it would be the spherical harmonics. If I would take any bounded domain in the plane, I would get other functions that would look like the Fourier, but would not be necessarily the Fourier, but, I, but they would be very similar in nature and in uh, construction to the Fourier. Okay, so in, did, in that respect, okay. we did, uh, gave intuition, but uh, we gave intuition only for uh, signals between zero and one. And uh, then, um, and then we claimed that a basis would be the cosines and the sines. And then I said that look, the cosines and the sines are the uh, if they are the eigenfunctions of this uh, of this um, operator, uh, then they are optimal. I mean, you cannot find a different basis for representing functions uh, in a worst sense case, in the sense of functions that belong to my uh, class of functions um, psi omega. And, and um, the way to do that was to use the Poincaré trick uh, in order to pull myself out uh, in the continuous case. In the discrete case, it, it is much simpler. I mean, it is more intuitive in a sense. And what you will have to do is basically repeat the same proof uh, that would allow you to prove optimality. More? So if there are no further questions, let me just tell you that what we will talk about in the next lecture is I, I will push the furthest point something to the end because it is not within the flow of what we are talking about right now. It is a really cute thing of using the pigeon hole principle in order to prove a way of optimally of almost optimally sampling uh, some data points. And in the next lecture, I would like you to think about the following problem. And this is the following problem. I have on the left, uh, zero t, zero one t axis set of functions. And on the right, I have a different parameterization of my domain, which is called tau. And I would say that the same function is representing is represented on on both uh, on both domains, but with a different parameterization. So, for example, if I have uh, a function that looks like that here, then here it could look like that. So it would get exactly the same values. So this value would probably be that value, and that value would probably be that value. But I stretched and squeezed the tau axis so that it would not align anymore one-to-one -one with the t axis, okay? So if I plot my tau axis here and my t axis here, there is a monotonic function that is relating between the two. So each, so again, it should be a function. Let me just redraw it, so. So each point T is mapped by this function to uh, the index in tau. So it would take, for example, T1 here, and it would map it onto tau1 there. Now on tau, I have my second order derivative, for example, of tau that are generating my E tilde tau functions, okay? And on T, I have another set of basis functions. And these are basis functions on T. Okay, so here I have E of T equals lambda I E I. And the question then is what happens when I'm taking my psi of t here 
and I'm taking my uh, psi tilde of tau here, and I'm projecting them onto their corresponding eigenfunctions here and here, okay? So I'm taking psi um, tilde of tau and projecting it onto E tilde uh, I of tau, okay? And I'm also, so this would be, I don't know, let's call it beta, not beta, beta is a bad number. It's a bad, uh, let's call it uh, psi tilde j. Okay, these are the coefficients there. And let's do similarly for, uh, for psi t that I'm projecting onto e i t. Okay, so here the projection is with respect to tau, and here the projection is with respect to t. The integration here is done with respect to tau, integration here is done with respect to t. And I'm getting other coefficients, let's go call them psi uh, i, okay? And the question then, is there any relation between these two coefficients? And what is even more important, and this is a, not a trivial assumption or a trivial conclusion, is is the relation between these coefficients and these coefficients depends on the function? What do you think? Would the relation between these coefficients and these coefficients depend on the definition on the function itself? No. Again? I think that no. Why? Uh, because you, you change something in the, in the, Shape in the geometry of the space, not on, not in the function. Well, but I can have, but again, I can have a two different function. Ah, come on. How do I do that? Okay, so assume that I have a different function here, and the same corresponding different function there. they would be different. I mean, the coefficients would definitely be different. I mean, what Barak said is ob obviously correct, but I don't think that it is so trivial to see that. So what Barak is saying is that translating between uh, these coefficients to these coefficients, uh, I, I can be independent of, of my functions themselves. By the way, is the translation between these coefficients and these coefficients linear? I mean, would it just be a multiplication by a matrix? or would it be more complicated? So this is a more involved. So what Barak is saying, look, the only thing that changed between the two uh, domains is the stretching and uh, stretching and squeezing of the T of the X axis of the T of the time axis. Now, my question goes as follows. Would the transformation between the coefficients onto the Fourier that lives in this domain and the Fourier that lives in this domain uh, linear? I mean, can I, write some function, let's call it C. Okay, so this would be some function C that would take my uh, psi tilde coefficients into my psi uh, regular psi coefficients. I mean, would this be a linear transformation? Um, we hope so and uh... There, there are something called the rotation matrix, I think, uh, because they, we just uh, changed the geometry of uh, the functions. Uh, yeah, but, the it, it but note that the geometry here and the geometry there are different. I mean, you stretch and squeeze uh, some of the functions. But we show that we can represent each function by its corresponding EI basis which we showed that we can uh, transform using the DFT, which is linear. So maybe the relationship between the EIs is also linear in some sense of the DFT. Well, forget about the DFT for a moment, but um, the relation is luckily linear. And the reason it is related indeed to rotations, but this is not so such a simple rotation, um, what, what you do is you linearly transform uh, these uh, coefficients into these coefficients and the entries 
let me just give you the final word about it. The entries of these coefficients, the CIJs, are nothing but the inner product of the EIs translated into tau into EJs tilde of tau in the tau basis. Okay, so the elements of the matrix that transforms uh, the coefficients of projecting psi into this basis here and psi uh, uh, tilde into this basis there would be nothing but the inner product uh, between the eigenfunctions. I mean, taking the eigenfunction from here, translating it to there, and then uh, and then inner producting it with the eigenfunctions here. So I'm taking this eigenfunction, which is that guy projected here, and hitting it with this eigenfunction of the Laplacian here. Okay, and these would be the entries of this translation matrix. You can think about it as, as rotation, but uh, it's not. It wouldn't be exactly rotation uh, if the squeezing and the stretching of the tau is is something arbitrary. Isn't it uh, transforming between two orthonormal bases? But no, 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 no. You need to be careful here. This would be orthonormal with respect to t. This would be orthonormal with respect to tau. This is really important. These are not the same orthonormalities. When I'm translating uh, E from uh, T to tau, it would no longer be orthonormal with respect to the, uh, to the E tilde of tau. So hitting it with these guys. Now, let me give you uh, an extreme example where I did nothing. Assume the T and tau are exactly the same. Let me just say that I will not be able to take it right now. Um, assume that uh, T and tau are exactly the same. In that case, the E's would be exactly the same and the inner product would be nothing but the identity. Okay, and then everything is fine. We are really, really cool with that. Okay. But if tau would not be the identity, I mean, if I stretch and squeeze tau uh, in some way, then the E's uh, and the E tel the tildes would not be the same. I mean, they would not communicate with one another. I mean, they, com they, they could communicate, but I need to decipher their communication in order to translate uh, from uh, one to the other. So just think about it. In the next lecture, we'll talk about it. In the recitation, we'll talk about it. Uh, and, and if you have more questions, now is the time. This is not a trivial uh, material. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, spaces, abstract spaces. Uh, we are trying to lend everything into one-dimensional one examples, but still, if you have difficulties, uh, the recitation should help you with that. And if you need further help, then email me directly, and I'll be happy to uh, redo my uh, uh, to redo my uh, explanations again, again, again. It's it's uh, again, it's a non-trivial. Uh, it's a non-trivial uh, way of uh, thinking because you take everything from the uh, one-dimensional function into some space, either betas or is, and then you need to think abstractly. So if they have been able to confuse you a little bit in calculus, now we are taking it to the limits. So if there are no questions, then thank you for your attention and uh, we'll meet again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.